Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Detention. Uh, we are so excited to be joined here tonight by our very special guest, Lindsay Corbin. Needs little introduction, of course, so we're going to get after it. Corbin is one of the most consistent athletes on the long-distance Ironman circuit, finishing in the top 10 at Kona in 2008, 2012, 2013, 2018, and 2019. She is a eight-time Ironman champion and stood on the 70.3 World Champion Podium in 2011. Her vision is to transcend the boundaries of sport and represent the importance of a sound mind, body, and diet in achieving dreams. Lindsay recently went through a coaching change, shifting from her longtime coach, Jesse Kropelnicki at KT2 Systems, to Jesse Moore of Moore Performance Coaching, who we had on the show just a few weeks ago. Um, we're going to talk with Lindsay today about that coaching change, also about what the past 12 months have looked like for her, looking ahead to 2021 uh, and her side project, Hazel and Blue. Lindsay Corbin, welcome to Detention. Hello. <laughs> I've never been in detention. So I actually, why don't, why is it called detention? I know I shouldn't be asking the questions, but yeah. <laughs> I've never understood why it's called detention. So it's called detention because um, we are the endurance school. And so detention is where we go to think about what we've done. And Chris and I both spent a lot of time in detention um, early on in our in our lives. And so the first question that we already always ask people, you have already answered, which is, have you ever been to detention? <laughs> no, huh. I was definitely the goody two shoes. <laughs> Listen, follow the rules, no Athletes. detention for me. <laughs> <laughs> no scholastic trouble of any kind, no getting caught sneaking out in high school, no um, taking off the dean's list at, at college? No, I saved it all till I turned 20 and then turned into a hellion for about a year. <laughs> nice. I'm glad uh, there was that, some of that. <laughs> that could be like the title of your autobiography, like uh, one year in detention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just went all in. I got like a tattoo. I smoked pot. I did, I don't know. I did like everything you weren't supposed to do all within like a year. And then I went back on the straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. That's very, uh, very efficient. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you've already answered one of our warm up questions. So excellent work. You're efficient as always. Um, so we've been doing this for about a year now. Uh, the whole reason that this show and this channel even came to be was because we all had to go inside and try to find a way to stay engaged with the people we work with. What has the last year made room for in your life? Yeah, that's a good question. We actually were together with people the other day and they, well, it was actually a virtual get together, even better. <laughs> and they, one of the questions that came up in the group was like, what skill set did you develop in the last year? And Chris and I like really had to think about like, God, what skill set did we develop? But, um, yeah, I can't, I mean, I don't know if I can like necessarily say like one thing in particular. I mean, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but I actually took almost a step back from triathlon or from being like Lindsay the triathlete last year and um, just really got to hang out with Lindsay Corbin, the person. <laughs> so I did a lot of like side small projects. I got a garden going. Um, I stepped away from like specific training and just exercised and moved my body for fun and for enjoyment and got back that sense of adventure and like got back to the roots of why I got into the sport. Um, did a lot of cooking and, you know, yeah, eating good food, helping my husband out with some projects. And so, yeah, I don't know if I can think of like one skill set of like, I'm new because of this because of the last year, but I definitely feel that I'm a better person because of what I've gone through in the last year. So, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the garden? What are you growing? And did you, what did you learn in the process of creating it? <laughs> um, well, I'm not growing anything currently. I live in Bend, Oregon. Um, and so it's obviously mountain town, pretty cold here. So not quite growing season right now, but um, yeah, I grew um, a bunch of different herbs and tomatoes and the tomatoes like if you've never grown cherry tomatoes will like take over your entire yard slash house if you let them <laughs> so that's one thing I learned um but it was kind of a cool process of like planting stuff from seed seeing it grow um nurturing it I guess um 
I don't know. And then obviously being able to then turn it into food you can eat is pretty cool to like the whole circle of life. So mm -hmm. yeah, our neighbors were pretty stoked to be like, here's some fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Now, I was going to ask you how out of control the tomatoes got um, in in New England, like when it's zucchini season, people will like, if there's like a car with a window open, people will like offload their extra zucchini, in, like, like strangers cars, was it that kind of thing? Yeah, no, well, we definitely had more and then the tomatoes all came good at the same time. So it was like waiting, 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 waiting. And then every day you'd go out and check and every day you'd go out and check and then all of a sudden it was like a million cherry tomatoes. <laughs> all at once. <laughs> so when we were talking before we went live, you also let us know that you've recently gotten into March Madness. Can you tell us a little okay. bit about where that came from? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I don't even know. Well, um, I was saying my, my dad actually played college basketball or college hoops. So he's always been a basketball and I tried to play basketball when I was in junior high and I was terrible. I spent more time on the bench than I did on the court. So I, anyone that knows me well is like, like this probably isn't surprising to bag, but I'm not coordinated at all. So me dribbling a basketball is like a terrible idea. But um, I think, I mean, I've always been a sports fan, whether it's running, skiing, like Olympics, triathlon, obviously. And so um, I think I'm just like desperate for sports. And so I usually don't follow March Madness at all, but there's some really good storylines this year. And I feel like um, it's almost the tournament of the underdogs. A lot of the underrated teams or undervalued teams are actually crushing it. And so I like the story behind it and obviously seeing these teams that, um, you know, maybe shouldn't do well, do well. And then it's also fascinating as like a sport in general, like our sport, but then also other sports to see how COVID has impacted that. And so it's like, well, why are all these underdog teams doing well? Is it because they did this, this, and this, this last year? Or is it because there's no fans in the crowd? Like that's what my husband, Chris thinks is like, oh, because there's no fans dictating the, you know, the games in the stadium that that's impacting the performance. But yeah, I don't know. It's just been interesting and fun to follow. So yeah, I've been in, in, in typical Lindsay, like I'm all or nothing with everything. So it's like, I'm all in, like I didn't miss a single game over the weekend. <laughs> and then, yeah, so go basketball. And I have no bracket. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of wanted to follow up on that, that like all or nothing aspect of, of yourself. Like when did you first recognize that about yourself? Oh man, it's a work in progress. I don't even know. It actually probably is like just coming to light more so now because my former coach Jesse always was like this is an area where we could improve and then my new coach Jesse is saying the same thing so when you have two trusted individuals that are telling you that you've got this personality that is a definite I think a strength and like has helped me as a, as both a person and an athlete but can also be seen as a weakness like I've stress fractured my femur twice, and that's probably thanks to this all or nothing personality type thing. Um, so, I mean, I guess like I've always known my whole life, like I don't need a coach to tell me that I go all in and like anyone that knows me knows that I'm super dedicated. And yeah, I always go all in on, on whatever task it is that, um, you know, whether it was school or triathlon or I'm gonna go hike a mountain. Like I always, um, you know, give my best effort and put everything into it and, um, so yeah, I guess I've always known that, but it's been interesting to see someone new that's come into my life, which is Jesse Moore, to be like, we need to work on this because yeah, sometimes as an athlete, it, it can be a detriment as well as a positive thing. So yeah. So you have referred to the past year also as your sabbatical. Can you tell us a little bit about, about how you ended up on a sabbatical and something that you, what have you learned during this time? What is this made room for? Yes. Yeah, so it was interesting, you know, it's crazy to think that like it was a little over a year ago that this all started, but um, I was training like it was going to be a normal season. And I was actually down in Tucson um, with Heather Jackson, who I go down there every spring to do training with. And um, I ended up getting injured and I got a stress reaction, not a fracture um, in my femur. And so I came home early um, from that and shame on me for having my phone on. Sorry, just turned it on silent. <laughs> Detention. <laughs> 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 like send me to the back of the class. Um, 
anyway, so I came home from that basically at the start of COVID and I knew I needed to take some significant time off. And so I took time off to heal and then it came time to start training again. And then we were like really in the thick of COVID and it was um, quite apparent that there wasn't going to be any racing anytime soon. And um, I think I hadn't realized it at the time, but I was maybe a little bit burnt out at the end of 2019 and um, probably overreaching a bit, which is maybe where the injury came from. And so looking back on all that, I was like, you know, I think I'm gonna just take a step back and use this time to refresh my mind, refresh my body. Um, I'm definitely near the end or the peak of my career and I wanna get the most out of myself. And I thought, you know, for me personally, that you know, taking a step back um, would maybe be the best path for me. And so, yeah, it was more just like I needed a mental reset um, as well as the physical reset as well. And um, I thought, oh, I'll just go like a couple months without a training plan. And then a couple more months went by and I just wasn't feeling super motivated and races were getting more and more canceled. And so it just turned into a year or a summer of just being more free form. And um, again, like um, just this idea, this concept um, that is weighed heavy on my mind is like I've always identified myself as this athlete and all of a sudden you're not this athlete and who are you? And so, yeah, just getting to like know or be comfortable that like I can, there's more to me than just being an athlete, I guess was kind of what I really wanted to focus on. And I mean, hopefully I put a deposit into myself as an athlete by taking that step back, but it definitely took a lot of courage and it wasn't you know, I mean, I was texting with Bag a couple times this summer and he, somehow we got the idea that it was a sad sabbatical because it was tough to like have that identity to me feel like it was taken away. And I, um, you know, coming full circle, I know that like I really missed having structure in my life. I missed having goals that I was working towards. Um, I missed um, having a coach athlete relationship and sort of being told what to do, um, that definitely is, is a good thing for me as an athlete. And so, yeah, there were definitely some positives that came with it, but it was also uncomfortable at times, I guess, because you're like, who am I and, and what am I doing? And, and the path that I took feels very different than maybe what a lot of other athletes did, um, at least elite athletes. And so, yeah, you question like, was this the right choice or, or was it not? And I don't think we really know who made the right choice the last year because it's still going on. But um, yeah, that's kind of, I guess, where things are at for me, though. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so as we've alluded to a few times, you've made a coaching change recently after being with Jesse at QT2 for almost 10 years. Um, first yeah. of all, can you tell us why you decided to make a change? Yeah, so it kind of goes back to that sabbatical that I took was just I took um, the break from Jesse at QT2 and we still talked you know like once a week just to like fill him in on what I was doing and make sure that I was not doing anything too crazy um, but I was yeah I was just kind of burnt out like I said at the, the end of 2019 which is why I wanted to like take the break and then the end of the year came and it was time to like start training again for 2021 and I just was not super excited to go back to <laughs> the same program and the same sort of routine that I've been doing year in, year out. And I um, had met a friend for coffee and um, was just sort of explaining the situation because we asked like, have you started back to your training? What are you thinking about? And um, it's actually Matt Lieto and Matt was like, I just feel like maybe a change would be really, really good for you. <laughs> and so I don't know. I. Um, Think that he's pretty good like he knows me really well and is good with advice and things like that and the more i thought about it i was kind of like you know what i only have a few years left and i really want to be able to enjoy those and get the most out of myself and so i'm going to take this big risk which it definitely is a risk i realized that like there was nothing wrong with jesse kropelnicki at qt2 like we had huge success like i don't even maybe we won five ironmans together we set the american record um at the time i mean top 10 in kona like so many great things happened there and um i'm sure i would have had continued success with that but it was more just like mentally i just needed some new motivation and and um yeah when you've been doing the sport as long as i have that's kind of um yeah things can get stale so i guess yeah the short answer is that I was a little burnout and looking for some new ideas. 
So what did you look for as you were starting the search for a new coach? Uh, what were the things that you had in mind? Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess the one thing about someone that's been doing the sport as long as I have is like, you know yourself pretty well and you know mm -hmm. what you're looking for and what those qualities are. And when I looked for Jesse Kropelnicki years ago, I had like a huge extensive list and I interviewed multiple coaches and went through like all this research and, and definitely dotted my I's and crossed my T's. And with Jesse Moore, like he's the only person I talked to and it was definite like, I didn't really shop around and um, I was referred to him through Matt Lieto. So, I mean, Matt, I asked Matt, like, I don't know about going to a new coach. I don't know if I really want to shop around and, and what do you think? And he said, oh, I know this guy, um, Jesse Moore, and I'd never heard of him. <laughs> which is probably like, that's actually almost an allure to me. Like I like that people don't know who he is. I don't know why, but um, yeah. And we had one phone call and we ended up talking for like almost two hours and I just got good feelings from it. But um, yeah, I guess that there was some like personal criteria for me of like things that I was looking for. And he seemed to tick a lot of those boxes um, of things that were important for me. And so yeah, it's individual for each person though. Like if people are wondering, like, what are you looking for? I think you really have to ask yourself of like, what kind of environment or things do you thrive in and what are you looking for? And I mean, for me, the first time around when I found Jesse Kropelnicki, like I wrote down a list of like 10 things that were really important to me, but um, probably number one on my list always, like it, it wouldn't even change and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, pertaining to coaches, but I think um, someone that genuinely cares like that's that's a non-negotiable for me like i don't want someone that just like sees me as as a client or like i want them to be just as invested as i am and that was one of the number one questions i asked jesse kropelnicki and then that was one of the ones i asked jesse moore as well so yeah i think that for me that's i've always i guess i'm invested go, going back to that like all or nothing thing and i would hope that the people on my team feel the same way if you don't mind sharing, what are some of the other questions that you asked Jesse Moore? Yeah, um, well, I asked him, you know, basic questions like how the, the training would work, how it would lay out, um, areas he thought that he could be able to help me in. Um, I asked him a few personality <laughs> questions, like things that are important to me. Like I noticed um, I tend to overthink a lot and be a, be someone that questions and overthinks. And so I tend to gravitate more towards people that um, are fairly confident mm -hmm. and not cocky, but I definitely need someone that's gonna like shoot me straight. And so I asked him, um, you know, how he fell into that category or what he thought, but I work with a physio, Jay DeSherry, who I'm sure people have heard of. And Jay is a very confident person and, and um, I feel like when I work with people like that, I don't have to spend as much energy doing the overthinking because you trust in that individual. So um, yeah, that was one thing that was kind of important to me or that I asked about. And then, um, yeah, and also communication. Like I just was curious, like how he communicated um, with athletes and how much he communicated, um, things like that. What differences have you noticed? I know it's only been a little while at this point, but what's been, um, what stood out to you? Yeah, no, we're 10 weeks in to working together. So I definitely am like getting to know the routine or whatever, but um, the workouts are a lot more specific for sure. Um, and they're a lot more challenge, like they're challenging just in different ways. So some things are actually quite a bit easier um, than what I was used to. And um, the volume is maybe a little bit less. And so I've had to um yeah just get used to that but i was saying earlier when we were chatting it's actually been like really good because i've had to develop almost this beginner's mindset or a growth mindset and basically when i knew that i was going to make a change i was like you have to check like all your notions and preconceived ideas at the door and this guy does probably doesn't want to be argued with of like well, I want to be riding more or I should be doing this or I did this, this, and this, and that worked. And so I feel like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I've done a good job, but I feel like personally, I would give myself a pat on the back for like knowing only one way of training for eight years and then having that flipped upside down to something completely different and sort of embracing that and adapting to it. 
Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, there's definitely been quite a few differences and then there's also some things that are pretty similar. Um, so yeah. What are some of the lessons that you'll hold on to from your previous coach? Oh man, so many, like, um, yeah, Jesse Kropelnicki is, is an amazing coach and, um, we still talk. And actually one thing that was pretty cool was that the two Jesse's got together and shared all the secrets on me <laughs> to hopefully accelerate Jesse more. And I don't know what they talked about. I wasn't there for the conversation, but, um, I think, um, I learned a lot about fueling and consistent training and rest and recovery and durability self-belief i don't know i could list like a million things from that i learned from qt2 but a lot of the things i am still applying to what i am doing with jesse moore so i didn't just like switch up everything and like go vegan and and do rides without fuel and um yeah train at midnight and all sorts of crazy stuff so and even like um we all three of us just did our first well for me it was my first long distance gravel race okay. and a lot of the um lessons on like fueling and um just getting through an endurance event like that i would say a lot of that came from lessons i learned through qt2 and jesse problem nike so yeah so working with a new coach at this point after last year and in the kind of the time that we're in, how did you guys go about setting goals for this season? Yes. Yeah, so we haven't, I don't know if this is like good or bad. <laughs> we haven't really set any goals or like talked about anything. I think it was just, let's just get going with training and kind of see what the shape of what our sport is going to look like this year. Um, and I mean, he, asked for sort of what my long-term goals are. And so I think we're on the same page of what I would like to accomplish while working together with him. Um, but we haven't like set specific goals for the year. I mean, for sure, um, an area that I feel like I need to improve is my cycling. And so I think I'm definitely getting worked over in the cycling department. And so, but we haven't said specifically, like we want to raise your bike by 10 Watts or you know, we're going to raise your threshold, but, um, I would assume that we're definitely working on my bike from the amount of time that a I've spent on the bike and be the type <laughs> of workouts that I'm doing. But, um, I come from a running background. So I think, you know, for me, the key with running is don't get injured and just, you know, be able to train consistently. And I usually can rely on a strong run. And then the swim is the swim. Like I'm always working on that. Um, but I would say the focus has been definitely on the bike in the last 10 weeks. Is there a goal that you have for, for like 2021 explicitly? Like, is there one sort of that you have been thinking about that you would like to accomplish this year? Yeah, well, one of them I already accomplished, which was I wanted to do a race. <laughs> Last year, I didn't race at all. <laughs> didn't even pin on a number. So I did um, the gravel race, I guess, two or three weeks ago with you guys in Shasta. Um, and then another goal was that I wanted to do some sort of adventure or something that put me out of my comfort zone. So we just like knocked out two goals in the first month of working together. <laughs> um, but I feel a lot more optimistic about racing this year than I did last year. Like last year, I wasn't even training or races weren't on my radar. And so my eyes are definitely on Kona. Like that's what's driven me as an athlete for the last however, five, six, eight years. And, um, you know, my goals for that remain the same. And that's definitely my driver. I would say in the final stages of my career is, is, um, improving upon or just getting the most out of myself at Kona. So I've already qualified for it. If it ever happened, <laughs> it was, um, obviously delayed or they moved our qualification from 2020 to this year. So fingers crossed for October. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Trying not to get too. Yeah. I just feel more optimistic this year. That there's going to be racing than I did last year. So we'll see. Okay. Is it possible that you were the first qualifier for yeah. 20? Yeah. Because you qualified at Wisconsin in 2019. Yeah. Okay. So you were the, you were the longest elapsed qualifier for yeah. 2021 Kona. Nice. Congratulations. <laughs> and it, it's actually like kind of scary that like you could just basically not race till Kona if you wanted. 
I personally won't do that because I feel like my body definitely needs to be like shocked into like remember what it's like to do an Ironman and a 70.3. But yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like you don't really have to race till October if you don't want. <laughs> So we have a lot of questions for you about the gravel race, and there are definitely some questions in chat, um, some folks who want to hear more, um, and many people saying hello to Chimmy. Um, but it's actually I, mostly Chimmy. Yeah, there's a lot of Chimmy in there right now. Um, but I do want, before we move off of the, the coach switch, um, do you have any advice for athletes who are thinking about working with a new coach, um, having managed this process so successfully? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, I think communication is everything. I think if you are upfront about what you want and what you need as an athlete and like what your expectations are, um, then there's no questioning of like, am I getting what I asked for? Or am I getting what I paid for? Um, and I think some of that you have to have confidence in yourself to even be able to communicate what your needs are. But I think, yeah, it's important to know. I mean, Jesse Moore said, I don't have a squad environment. So if like you want group training or things like that, like I can't provide that for you. And that was fine with me. Like I do a bunch of training. I would say 75 to 80% of my training is solo. Um, and so I'm fine with that. But someone that maybe does need a squad environment, like that would be good to know. So I don't know. I like the idea of what I did of like, here's what's really important to me. And, and you list 10 things. And then here's 10 things that you know you don't want in a coach and um so that would be like one piece of advice would be to like write down and be specific about what you're looking for and also realize like no coach is perfect no one's gonna fit all those needs but if you can find someone that you know ticks a lot of those boxes then um you know that that would be a good fit and then i think don't be afraid to like shop around you know i mean it's a big investment. And I mean, I pay a monthly fee. I know, you know, coaches, a good coach charges a fair amount of money. And so it's, um, you don't want to like be with the first person you talk to, which I realized I just did. <laughs> but <laughs> There's so many good qualified, awesome coaches out there. Like I wouldn't be afraid to shop around or ask around. Like I think you know, word of advice or references is huge um, as far as, you know, what a good program is. So, yeah. Um, and don't be okay. afraid to change. <laughs> Say what? Don't be afraid to change. Like I was very hesitant and like nervous and it was, I don't know if I should change, but um, again, like going back to that growth mindset or beginner's mindset, like I was definitely uncertain about it and a bit shaken up when Matt's like, I think you should switch. And it was like, I don't know. And um, I definitely so far have not regretted, like it, it's definitely been new motivation for me as an athlete. And that's pretty cool that 14 years into a professional career, you're just as motivated now as you were when you started, so. Could you tell us the story of one of those like growth mindset workouts where you've been like, oh gosh, this is new and different and I don't know how this is gonna go. Yeah, well, I would say almost every workout is like that. Like, I don't think I've been given the same workout more than once as far as um, bike workouts go. And with Jesse Kropelnicki, a lot of our workouts were very repeatable, which is nice because it's a way to track progress. But then you sometimes know what's coming and you're like, oh, five by 10 minutes. Like, here's what I did last time. And here's where I hope I would do this time because you're always expecting to be kind of improving. And I think that that was where I maybe hit my ceiling with Jesse Kropelnicki was just, I expected everything, nothing was new to me and it was just very expected. And so um, the workouts from Jesse Moore are very specific. And um, a lot of them are a lot of high end and, and workouts I've never seen before. And so it's kind of exciting because you don't know necessarily like how to execute the workout or how your body is going to feel or um yeah or what success even looks like you know you're just out there kind of giving it your best effort so i don't know i would say i have three very specific like hard bike workouts a week and every single one of those i've had to approach with like okay take a deep breath we're gonna try something new here <laughs> so it's been pretty fun and then again um i think just adapting to maybe a little bit less volume um i'm very used to like 
you got to hit 50 miles a week with your run and you got to be hitting 15 hours a week with your ride and, you know, seven hours of swimming. And um, it's a lot more probably quality versus quantity and, and maybe a step down in mileage. But um, I would say I feel fresher. So that's kind of been good for me or I have more energy. Like I finished training at the end of the day and I'm able to go to detention and chat. Whereas normally <laughs> it's like, I'm so tired. I can like barely get dinner together. So yeah. Everybody wins. <laughs> so we have a great question um, from chat from another bench local, um, Jenny G. And uh, she would like to know if pros have to test the same way that we do. And did you have to do that at the beginning of your work with new Jesse? Yeah, so I'm not 100% sure what you do for testing, but I did do an FTP test, which I don't think I ever once did under QT2. <laughs> I maybe did some testing under QT2, but it was in a sneaky way. It was never like, we're going to give you an FTP test. And so I did my first ever FTP test, which again, like that goes back to this beginner mindset of like, what you've been a professional athlete since 2006 and you six and you've never done an FTP test. And again, it's like, do you go out hard? Do you go out easy? Like, do you pace this? Do you go out heart rate? Like, what do you do? So, um, and I'm still like a head case. Like I get nervous and I wanted to take caffeine beforehand to like, make sure I did good and, and all those things. But, um, yeah, I'm just like everyone else. I'm sure I didn't blow up though. So that was good. <laughs> What flavor of tests did you have to do? Um, I did the 20 minute or it's a good yeah. one. Ooh, brutal. How did you enjoy it? <laughs> it was kind of fun. Actually, I was, I mean, I literally barely trained last year and my fitness levels were terrible at the start. So I was almost a blessing in disguise because I went in with such low expectations and I hadn't really done anything hard yet. So in my head, I was thinking like, I hope I can push 200 Watts <laughs> or like a 20 minute test as a professional athlete. That's like, you can push way more than 200 Watts. So my expectations were super low. And I actually feel like it would almost be harder now because I've achieved this level of fitness and I know my numbers more, but I mean, I literally didn't do a single interval last year. I didn't look at a power meter. I didn't use a Garmin. I didn't do any run specific workouts, nothing. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess it was kind of exciting because it was like, Oh, a workout, something specific. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's, uh, let's shift over to the gravel race because yes. that's definitely the other thing that everybody wants to hear about. Um, so first, first of all, nice little like warm up question. Uh, can you share a high point and a low point, uh, from your experience at the Shasta gravel run? Um, I mean, the whole thing was a high point. It was definitely a total adventure, which is pretty much what I wanted. Um, it, the race took place in Shasta. I think I had heard about it through you and VT and I was like, yeah, why not? I need a race. And this kind of ticks the box of an adventure. Let's do it. And then, yeah, we drove down there and we woke up race morning to snow <laughs> and I, the things that I worried about before the race were like so crazy. Like I was obsessed with like, what was I going to wear? How was I going to eat? Were people going to stop? Like I asked you so many questions, Chris, about how it was all going to go down. And then none of those things like basically mattered at all. <laughs> um, but I'll get back to answering your question. High point um, was actually combined with my low point in that I took a wrong turn on the course and I was with um, a group of age group men and decided to stay with them versus like going off by myself and probably getting lost. So we ended up like at the back of the race and I was like in so far last place and VT was up the road. And so in little Shastina, which is like little Lake Shasta, I came upon VT in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and I was so excited just to like find a friend and a familiar face and be like, Am I crazy? Is this crazy? I mean, the whole race was crazy. I mean, so much mud. Um, I can't really think of any low points. I mean, at the end of the day, I was disappointed because I'm a competitor that I was not in the mix. I was definitely wasn't thinking like I was going to win the race. And I had 
you know, not really big expectations going into it, but I am a competitor at heart and I don't handle not doing well, very well. <laughs> so if you had asked me like what I thought of the day, if it had been just like us riding bikes and it was just an event and not a race, I would probably say like 10 out of 10, I loved all of it. Like the adventure, the cold, the mud, the like riding the Jeep road, which was this chocolate milk river. Like all of that was awesome. But I would say my low point was just like, I wanted to be in the mix more because it's ingrained in me just to be a competitor. And, and I, I wasn't, um, but it didn't, that didn't overshadow the day for me. I still had fun and it was really hard. What do you think it was about the event um, that you, like if you decided to change careers now and become a, a professional gravel racer, like what would you, what, what are the things you think you would focus on in order to be in the mix next time? I, well, I mean, my bike skills, just like I haven't, I did cyclocross when I first started doing triathlon because I would ride any bike I could get my hands on. I haven't done cyclocross in like 12 years. And so the riding in the mud was definitely new for me. And then again, like coming from Bend, a lot of, I think I'd only done three rides outside this year before that. And so I feel like we hit that first patch of mud and it was like, oh, whoa. I almost forgot how to ride my bike. And so I definitely lost time in those technical, tactical sort of areas or sections. But that's also like what I was looking for was this adventure and trying something new. So um, I would probably brush up on my bike handling skills. And then again, just a little bit more fitness. Like I really had only been training properly again for about a month. And yeah, those, the women were so strong. I was really impressed with how strong everyone rode and I thought people would blow up and they didn't blow up and um, yeah, so. Um, we have a question from chat about your training. You sort of alluded to it a little bit, but only three rides outside through the winter. Could you talk a little bit about what your indoor training looked like to prepare for the race? Yeah, I don't think we necessarily prepared for the race. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, hey, can I do this race? And Jesse's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So, um, but the training has been, yeah, it's just been very specific. Um, it started out maybe not as, not doing as much high-end work, but um, with QT2, we did a lot of um, base miles where you would just be riding at like the same heart rate and, or the same power for xyz number of hours and i would just say that the range is a lot greater so it's a lot more dynamic style riding um and we're doing stuff like two minuters three minuters ten minuters i mean again none of the workouts are, are definitely the same but i think i've graduated from sort of jesse's base phase training to like more specific now um and we what we are doing is um a couple days a week usually wednesdays and then on the weekend um I'll do indoor training for maybe 90 minutes to two hours and then outdoor riding for the second half. So just to get me outdoors more. Um, but it's, I find it hard when it's super cold and the roads are sketchy to do specific workouts outside. And so the stuff inside has a lot more specificity. So that's my long way of answering is the stuff we're doing indoors is very specific. And then um, a bit more ride for fun outside where it's not as specific, but you're just getting miles in and, and riding the bike for fun and just enjoying yourself. So. Do you think you will do another one? I would like to, but I, I didn't finish it and be like, <laughs> I'm hanging up my triathlon bike and I'm never doing triathlon again and just sign me up for every gravel race there is. I, um, crashed at the end of the race, like maybe mile 85 or something on one of the bridges. And that definitely rattled me. And like the, and I think this was like a more technical, harder one, especially with the weather, but it seemed a bit risky to me. <laughs> and I actually, like, I grew up as a ski racer. I bomb the downhills on the bike. Like I love mountain biking. I definitely am a risk adverse person, but at the same time, like I really enjoy being a triathlete. And so I definitely want to give another one a try because I don't think I was able to like put forth my best effort. So I could see why they're addicting, but I haven't like signed up for one or anything like that. So I'm curious, I guess, and willing to do another one, but I'm 
still holding like um, the day after the gravel race, we stayed the night in Eugene and I went on a eight or nine mile run in Eugene and I was so happy running. And it's like, I freaking love being a triathlete. <laughs> and it was like, this is what I was missing yesterday. So um, I get a lot of joy from swimming and running still. So I'm not ready to let go of those um, parts of, of my day. What did you, what did you learn from the event? You know, like, um, you know, you said like, okay, bike skills are a thing I would need to work on, but what is something that you discovered in the race that you didn't know you were going to discover? Yeah, it was really hard, but it's a different kind of hard. Um, and I don't, I haven't done much of the trail running, but I'm very intrigued by that as well. And I would not be surprised if I ended up doing some trail running and, and ultra running in my future. And I, know from my trail running friends and from crewing a couple ultra um runs it felt very similar to that whereas like towards the end of the race or the last three quarters of the race like it's kind of similar to being in an ironman where you're just grinding away and at that point you're not really racing you're just like this is the pace i've got this is how i'm going these are my friends now that I'm riding with. <laughs> I don't even know where they're from. I mean, will you start talking with each other? But um, yeah, just as this relentless grind. Um, so it was very, like, I remember finishing and just being like, that was so hard, but it wasn't necessarily physically hard. Whereas like in an Ironman, you're like maybe pushing threshold at moments or 70.3, you're definitely like, on the rivet, you know, for four or five hours. And this was just more of like this long, and I think it required a lot more concentration than I had um, given it credit for, but just um, keeping your bike upright and being aware of what's going on around you. And um, there's no way like you could pre-ride the whole course. So you don't know how long the climbs are. So I think um, the mental concentration um, was a bit of a surprise and it just is hard, but it's a different kind of hard. Um, but I think that that's the allure to it is it's this ultimate sort of like adventure challenge of like total unknown, like you don't know what to expect. So if you're into those kind of things, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> I'm starting to feel much more confident about my own experience with it. Like, yeah, it was hard, but a different kind of hard. <laughs> it's exactly yeah, right. Yeah. And I will say, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back that I <laughs> didn't really fall apart. Like I thought I, the fueling was very similar to Ironman fueling. Hmm. So I actually went in with a plan similar to what I do for Ironman and I felt great the whole day. Like I never felt like I blew up or I overpaced it or things like that. Um, so props to the Ironman fueling. Like I think that there's um, the transfer over of the nutrition you know, aspect of long distance um, endurance sports carries across. Um, everybody who came to our state home camp last year definitely took away your cliff blocks every X amount of time. Oh yes. <laughs> did the did the did that play into the gravel fueling? That seems no, I know that I was stuck for your more, run. I stuck more to Ironman bike fueling for the there was no counting, like no, there's no time to count or eat shot blocks. And I was like pretty funny because it was a lot harder to eat because the roads are so rough and you just like grab whatever you can out of your pocket like there's no chance to be choosy but i felt like a chipmunk because there would be like a window of when you could eat and i would just like shove the entire cliff bar in my mouth and be like eating <laughs> with cliff bars and like both of my cheeks trying to get it down as fast as i can so the fueling is similar but it's also a challenge of like if you if i saw other people eating it was like okay i better eat now because clearly this is the opportunity to eat so, yeah, I think I ended up with like a cliff bar, like, like trap between my glove and my shifter for like 15 miles. And I was like, yeah. this thing is disgusting now. <laughs> I ate a lot more mud than I did. <laughs> um, so fueling is actually a part of your background as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Hazel and Blue, um, about your, uh, your, your side project, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So um yeah i've always been fascinated by sport nutrition i studied exercise physiology at the university of montana and um, was always intrigued by the sport nutrition courses and particularly like when i got into ironman i was fascinated about how you fuel for this long of an event and i feel pretty lucky that like the mentors i had early on that taught me about fueling were good people to listen to and i got good advice in the in the nutrition realm 
Um, but I found that um, every time I was doing Q and A's with athletes such as this, um, questions about fueling came up and people were really curious and people always want to know like, what do the pros eat and what's it like? And I do um, all the cooking in our household. That's just my husband and I, Chris. Um, but he grew up in a family where his mom cooked and I grew up um, in a family where um, both my parents cooked and we ate dinner at the table basically seven nights a week um, without like TV. Like we always, my parents would prepare a good meal and we'd sit down and enjoy the food and talk about our day. So um, I do, yeah, all the cooking for us. And I guess, yeah, people were interested in like, what do you eat as an athlete and how can you fuel yourself for these endeavors? And um, I think there's a lot of myths or maybe not good advice about fueling going around and, and fueling is very subjective for each person. It's a very individual thing, but I guess I just wanted to share some of the foods that I cook as an athlete and how I fuel myself. And um, it's a way also to like give back to the sport, um, but um, maybe in a way different than say coaching. I mean, everyone's like, oh, you should be a coach but I don't know if that's like an endeavor I want to take on. So I'm like, I'll just share with you good food that I eat <laughs> instead. What is some of that, like perhaps not so great food advice that you see floating around out there that makes you want to help? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different kinds of like crazy diets and things. I mean, I am curious by some of it and I question a lot of it. Like I've talked to Jesse Moore about it and Jesse Kropel, Nikki, but I am not a big fan of the fasted workouts and um, the like, I don't know. I've always just been everything in moderation, but it makes me wonder when people like go on a six hour ride and they're thinking, I'm only going to drink water today and try to tap into my fat stores. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be hanging out with you at mile at hour four of this bike ride because you are going to be very hangry <laughs> and I'm going to have to pull you home. <laughs> but um I mean, yeah, part of me has this mentality of like, you do you, but um, for me personally, like I've always been um, a consistent fueler. Um, so just fueling consistently throughout the workout. Um, and then again, like everything in moderation. So I definitely am down with like eating ice cream and eating cookies and, and treating yourself. Like we work out really, really hard. And especially for me, like when the hours crank up, like if you aren't, leaving room for splurges in your diet that's usually when you end up sick and injured and again like for me the goal as an athlete is consistency whether that's consistency in fueling or consistency in training the two almost go hand in hand um so yeah tell us about what you've been enjoying recently what have you been cooking that you've been how have you been breaking up the the pandemic uh monotony <laughs> Well, we started out doing a lot of baking <laughs> early on. It was like, how many sweet treats can we bake? And I actually feel like we've almost come full circle. Um, I've been making banana bread once a week. So I like went all in on the baking and then I took a break from it. And then my training has ramped up again. And I'm definitely a big believer in like whatever your body's craving, you need to give to it. And I do like a little treat with my coffee in the morning. So <laughs> Lately, we've been eating, um, yeah, like I've been making a loaf of banana bread once a week. And it is kind of nice to like finish training and then just like check out and be like, I'm going to go in the kitchen and, and make something. But um, I'm trying to think what else. I don't know. That's probably been what, I don't know. We had turkey burgers the other night. <laughs> I love it. I can't think of like anything specific that I've been like, yeah, probably the banana bread has been most recent. Um, so you, you also do some work for the core diet. You kind of help them out with, with the social media work and some yeah. other things. How do like, how do you, if you were to compare and contrast like core diet and hazel blue, like how do they kind of inform each other? Yeah. Um, I would say hazel and blue is more like recipe sharing and what I eat as an athlete. And then core diet, um, comes from QT2 systems and that's more not a diet, like I actually hate the word diet. And I think the core diet doesn't even like the word diet in core diet, but it's more just like, it should be called the core values of like how you eat. But it basically is um, like a system that they follow or subscribe to of like 
eating for endurance events. So that would be more specific like fueling plans and timing of carbohydrates and proteins. Um, and just, yeah, there's probably a lot of basic principles founded in the core diet that I personally still use as an athlete um, that I think most athletes, I would recommend to like most athletes. Um, I do feel fortunate I have a fairly high metabolism. So when it's time for me to like lean up for an Ironman, it's not that hard. Like I definitely can eat pretty free form and, and not that strict. Um, and yeah, I, do, I tend to like not cut carbohydrates or things like that. I'm not eating at, at McDonald's or fast food either. <laughs> like I, I would say most people that know me are like, oh, she eats pretty healthy. Um, but, um, when it does come time to like, oh, we want to get down to race weight. It doesn't take me much to like, Chris is like, you look in the mirror and you get a six pack basically. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. What are the splurges aside from banana bread? Obviously. Oh yeah. Um, I love cookies. Like I would say that that's my thing is like, I, I bake a lot of cookies for friends. I give away a lot of cookies. Um, I like ice cream. I haven't like had a, actually ice cream much lately, probably cookies. And then once a week, Chris and I'll do like a splurge meal of, of pizza or sushi or um, I don't know. I mean, we haven't really eaten out. Like that's the other thing. Like I cannot wait to like go out and just get a nice meal and, and relax and enjoy it. And like an appetizer and a dessert. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to eating, eating out someday. <laughs> I have to give a big shout out to, I know Kirby has already mentioned them in, uh, in chat, but the, the breakfast cookies on Hazel and Blue's website are excellent and have been keeping this person alive. <laughs> They're very good. Um, after you mentioned turkey burgers, uh, Jenny G also uh, said the turkey burgers for, from Hazel and Blue are super good. Oh, nice. Um, speaking of coffee and caffeine, I can't believe we skipped this for the gravel race. Um, you yeah. said you were going to take caffeine and you hadn't for like a year. Did you do it? What happened? Yeah. Yes, I took the <laughs> caffeine and then I was, you were there when I took it. But um, yeah, um, in 2015, I broke, um, I got a stress fracture in my femur in the neck. And so it was a pretty significant stress fracture. That's not really one that you want to joke around with. And I did uh, back to like the beginning when I was talking about how I'm an overthinker and I question a lot of things. I did basically a lot of research as to like, why did you break the largest bone in your body? And how can we make sure that we don't do this again? <laughs> because it was not a good experience, but I had never really like learned much about hormones and bone health and women's health and um, so I did like a deep dive into like the biology and, um, the science behind bone health and particularly my, I got a ton of blood work done and, and work with some endocrinologists and stuff. But one of the things I did learn was that caffeine can inhibit the, um, healing of bones. And so I went off caffeine in 2015, um, in help in hopes to like help aid in the healing of my stress fracture. And then ever since then, I basically have used caffeine um, as a performance um, enhancer. And it, a hun if you commit to the program and only use caffeine in very special situations, it 100% works. Like you can't do, I think it's kind of funny people like, I cut caffeine out for the week before my Ironman so I can like get a hit from it. Like you have to really commit to like only using caffeine on very special occasions. But when I do take caffeine, I swear I get superpowers from it. It is amazing and I absolutely love it. So I didn't have caffeine once last year cause I didn't really do any crazy workouts or any races or anything. And so I did have my first hit of caffeine at the gravel race and it was amazing. <laughs> do you drink but then later in the race when I like wasn't even in the mix, I was like, I'm going off the caffeine cause it's like, <laughs> we're going to save it for another day when it really counts. <laughs> uh, do you drink decaf? Is in the, is another yeah, question. Yeah, so chat. I do drink the, I love coffee um, and I have at least one a day, but yeah, I'm on the decaf train. So there is a little bit of, I mean, I guess that's cheating because there is a little bit of caffeine in decaf, but um, yeah, I don't really drink green tea or anything like that. Um, so yeah, if you see me and I have caffeine in my hand, watch out. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk your ear off. 
How many different caffeine creation devices are in the Corbin household right now? Or not caffeine, coffee creation uh, oh, systems. Um, I am pretty basic. Like I just have a French press every morning, but Chris rotates through what he likes. And Chris is on the caffeine train, so he doesn't, um, he'll drink coffee anytime. But um, I don't know, we probably have like five different devices. I know I've seen a Chemex there, an Aeropress. Yeah, it's, a, it's, yeah. A, it's nice. I, I enjoy, yeah, I enjoy I actually, visiting. Yeah, what happens is we travel. And so like we went to Brazil and they had like this Brazilian coffee maker and Chris was like, this is the best coffee ever. And I was like, well, it's probably because we're like in Brazil on the beach, like right. drinking it. But it, anyway, so we bought the apparatus and then you got to have your apparatus for camping coffee and then your Chemex for if you want a slow Sunday morning coffee. But I usually just do the French press every day. I love it. <laughs> well, I think it's just about time to wrap up. Um, I know you have dinner to get to and, and a life to lead, um, but thank you so much for joining us here tonight. This has been something that we've been looking forward to a long time, and there's been a lot of chatter in, um, in our weekday spins uh, leading up to this one. You're definitely a fan favorite. So thanks for taking the time to come and hang out with us. Um, Let me get Chim Wobby yes! on for all the fans. Yes. Hold on. Jimmy, come here. Yay. Maybe she'll come. Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy, come here. No, um, she's not. She's like, <laughs> I'd rather not. I'm busy. <laughs> I'll just post a picture of everyone for her on the socials. For Thank everyone. you. <laughs> Thank you. It'll be much appreciated. Um, for those of you who are joining us out in Twitch tonight, um, thank you so much for coming and thanks for being a part of this. It's been a very active chat, so we, we really appreciate all of what you guys bring to the community. Um, don't forget to join us on Thursday for Thursday uh, Zwift Ride and Saturday morning for our endurance spin. Um, follow me and Chris on Twi on Zwift. So many eyes. Uh, on Zwift uh, to make sure you get invited to those. And um, yeah, thank you again. Here is to a faster and happier and healthier tomorrow. Bye, guys. <laughs>